Well, it's noon here in New York City. <laughs> Welcome, everybody uh, from across the world. And this is a fantastic and very special seminar that Sandra has been leading for several years. And it's based on her book, The Intellectual Shamans, where she protocols and uh, <clears throat> researches and, and um, shares pearls of wisdom from those in the academic discipline that have been able to transform it. academics, but not just academics, uh, really like helping helping the world see differently and newly. Uh, and as I think some of you have said already here, this is something that's well much needed right now. And uh, I'm very happy and excited that Judy Neal here is with us, one of the, the transformational leaders and edge walkers, as she calls it, <laughs> and inspirations for uh, Sandra's book. So without further ado, I'll just thank everybody for being here. And if you could mute yourself, if you're not speaking, that'd be great. We're recording this. Um, so uh, thank you all for being here. And over to you, Sandra. Thank you, Michael. Um, and um, as you know, this, is, this um, series is run by the, the International Humanistic Management Association. And um, it, it has been going for several years. And I'm really thrilled that we have Judy Neal with us today. So the way this seminar usually works is that Judy will spend about 20 minutes or so making a presentation about some of her work. I will then interview her and then we'll turn it over to people who've asked questions. Please put your questions into the chat so that I can pick them up and turn to you. And I'll, I will ask you at that point to turn on your, um, your uh, video and your uh, mic and ask your, ask your own question. So, um, so hopefully you'll be able to um, do that, okay? So I am just thrilled that Judy Neal is with us today. Um, Judy's a scholar, an author, and a consultant. Um, she's focused and really led the charge on developing the whole idea of workplace spirituality, systemic change, and global consciousness. She received a PhD from Yale, University and has served both as an internal served as an internal consultant to Honeywell. She taught at the University of New Haven for many years and then became director of the center, the first director, um, the inaugural director of the Center for Faith and Spirituality in the Workplace at the University of Arkansas. She was one of the co-founders of the MSR Management Spirituality and Religion Division of the Academy of Man Management and has written ten books, um, written and edited. 10 books, including her own book, Edgewalkers, People and Organizations That Take Risks, Build Bridges, and Break New Ground. These Edgewalkers, I think, are the intellectual shamans or the shamans, the healers, the connectors, and the sense makers um, who, who do the kind of boundary spanning work that's necessary for organizations to improve, to heal what they're doing, and to um, make sense of that for all of us. Um, Judy currently is president of Edgewalkers International and executive director of the Global Consciousness Institute, which has some really in interesting initiatives going on. So again, please put your questions into the chat so we can pick them up and, um, and uh, yeah, ask them later, um, ask you to ask them later. Okay, Judy, I'm gonna turn it over to you and you have hosting privileges. So if you wanted to share slides, you should be able to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra, and thank you, Michael, for all that you're doing to build community, because that's such an essential part of collective shamanism in the world that we need right now. So I'm, I'm honored to be here, uh, was honored that you interviewed me for the book, Sandra, love your book, and um, I'm glad that there's a community that's being built around your work and the, the shared work that we have. So. I want to tell you all today about edge walkers, which is the same thing. Uh, we're just using different words, and sometimes we're not even using different words. We're, um, as Basho said, fingers pointing at the moon. We're, we're different fingers, but we're all pointing at the same thing. And so we'd use different language for that. Um, just, you know, trying to share what we can see and hoping that that helps open others' eyes to join this movement 
that I call a, a really, I mean, not I'm not the only one, but that there's a real shift in collective consciousness and that we're all a part of that and we're all being called to make a difference in these turbulent times. So what got, start, got me started on this whole idea of edgewalkers was um, back around the year 2000 or so, Fast Company came out with their initial inaugural issue and there was an article in there by Malcolm Gladwell, who wasn't famous yet, uh, just a you know like a five or six page magazine article, and he talked about quantum physics, and and he was talking about systems change and how quantum physics helps us to understand how systems change. So he talked about chaos as being the birthing ground of creativity. That that creativity comes out of chaos. And I was really struck by a statement he made where he said change happens on the edges of system, not in the middle. He said the purpose of the center of a system is to create stability and that it's change agents who are on the edge of the system. And in fact, they have a foot in the system and a foot in the outside environment or in other systems. And uh, one statement he made was change agents tend to live on the edge of a system. They also live holographically, like on the edge of their community. They, they're not, um, the, they're attracted to the edge because sometimes what they're doing is so radical that if the mainstream saw it, they would try to squash it. And yet this drive to change things for the better is you know an inherent part of our collective evolution. So being on the edge of a system is in a, a safer place to be when you're trying to create something that's never been created before. And while I was thinking about all this, um, one day I walked out of an airplane into an airplane terminal and saw this picture um, an advertisement for Cap Gemini, and I was so struck by it. I was studying Tai Chi at the time, and so I knew this to be a Tai Chi pose, and it looked to me like here's somebody doing Tai Chi on the top of a building in New York City. I didn't know if it was New York City, but it turns out it is, and that to me seemed like the quintessential image of an edge walker. And so I walked up closer and I saw that in small print, it said this was Tony Visconti, who's David's, David Bowie's producer. And since I'm a musician, I was like, oh, I have to talk to this person. Now I'm very shy. And so that was actually um, a radical idea for me to reach out to somebody who's famous and powerful and very intimidating to me. But I was so struck by this picture, I just felt I had to talk with him. And I did interview him and that became one of the first interviews for the book, Edgewalkers. And I define edgewalkers as people who walk between worlds and build bridges between those different worlds. They're, that's the connector part of the intellectual shamans. They are connectors, but they have a distinct Foot and for the main thing I look at is the material world, the physical world on the one hand, and the spiritual or the invisible world that shamans talk about going into the invisible world to get guidance for the tribe, the community, uh, to bring that back to guide us into from the present into the future. So edgewalkers have a very strong spiritual life strong spiritual practices and are grounded and effective in the everyday material world. And back when I was first exploring these ideas, that, um, as Sandra can remember, and Jim as well, um, you can remember that the idea of someone being spiritual and practical was hard to grab, get your mind around for most people. It was like, if you're practical, you're not spiritual. And if you're spiritual, you're not practical. But that really wasn't true when I started seeking leaders who had a strong spiritual life and who were very effective. And interviewing Tony was um, just an incredible 
experience. And I actually have verbatim his interview at the back of the book because he was the most articulate about what it is like to walk between the world of music business, in his case, um, to follow your intuition, to have spiritual practices, to be a healer, uh, and to do all this in a way that leads to wonderful business success for him and for those he represented. So here's some just basic characteristics, and then I'm going to get into very quickly some of the things about Edgewalker qualities and skills. Edgewalkers have always existed. We've always had those in society who are on the edge and who go into the invisible world to find more information and guidance for us. We call them mystics, shamans, healers, transformation catalysts. We have, we have lots of names for them, as Sandra talks about in the Intellectual Shaman's book. So they walk between worlds. And uh, one of the people I interviewed for the book was a, a woman, a lesbian woman. So she walks between the straight and the gay world. She came out of information technology and really wanted to work with the, the people side of the business. So she was a student, a doctoral student of mine. Uh, who was studying human resources. And so she was able to build bridges between the IT world, because she spoke that language and knew the technology, and the human resource world. And she understood change and systems and the human side of business. So she would walk between those two worlds. I mean, there, there's skills that apply to not only the spiritual and the material world, but practical things like walking between functions or walking between cultures, cross-cultural work. So those are some of the different worlds. Something that seems very common to these edge walkers and these intellectual shamans is they have a knack for knowing the future. First of all, they're hungry to know the future, but they, they have gifts and skills about knowing the future. They are always looking to create new rules to the game because they want to improve things. They want to make systems better. And an interesting um, thing that I found when I interviewed people about their life stories and their career changes and um, their spiritual path was they would often talk about making major changes in their lives out of a sense of calling. And other people would say, oh, that was such a risky move. And their response was always, it wasn't risky. I just knew. There was this real sense of trust of being on a path and being called. And I think we can all agree that people like this are needed more than ever right now because of the systems breaking down. Something new is emerging. It's hard to see what it is. So we need new ways of building a better future that works for everyone. So the research questions I asked as I interviewed people were, um, these were the basic questions. What can we learn from Edgewalker leaders? Just as Sandra talked about, what can we learn from intellectual shamans in academia? How does their spiritual practice help them in a complex changing world? How is this different from ways other respond to change. And so some of my basic questions when I interviewed people is, how did you become an edge walker? And what attracts you to living in two or more worlds? What qualities help you to bridge these worlds? By qualities, I mean those things that are the essence of what that person is. And what skills help you to bridge these worlds? So, Here's a quick summary of five qualities that I found people, most, most of the people I talked to had most of these, and then the five skills. So I would say the qualities are the beingness, the skills are the doingness. So the, the qualities are self-awareness, that's bedrock. They have self-awareness practices. They want to know themselves better. They're very introspective. They have a strong sense of passion and calling and a sense of purpose, high integrity. And by integrity, I'm not saying just ethics. I'm saying they know their values. They really know what are their core values and 
they strive, not perfectly, but they strive to live in alignment with those values. They're visionary, and I do mean visions as in the shamanic being able to have visions. And people had different practices around visioning what needs to unfold or what is being called to unfold. Um, everything from vision quests to we're finding more and more people now doing psychedelic journeys and um, different different processes, but mostly time and nature. That was one of the biggest things. And Jim, that is where I began to see the connection between spirituality and sustainability. Because if we don't have places in nature to go, we will not have something that nurtures our spirituality. We'll lose that. And then we need our spirituality to help do the sustainability work that has to happen in the world. And the characteristic that was most shocking to me or surprising, delightfully so, was that they're very playful. These leaders all have this spontaneous sense of humor, creativity, um, and that makes them a real joy to be around. I put a picture here of Igor Sikorsky, who I did not interview because he's dead. Um, he died 30 years before I wrote this book, but I was doing, a, I was teaching a class on organizational change at Sikorsky Aircraft in Connecticut. And um, people kept talking about Mr. Sikorsky and what an amazing man he was. And it turns out he was a mystic and there are writings about him and his way of going into the future to see the design of a helicopter or of an airplane and his really strong intuition. Um, and I've written an article that, about him based on some of the research I did, but he was very inspirational to me about this CEO who escaped out of Bolshevik Russia and was able to um, build a whole company uh, and was beloved even by people who never met him. The skills are sensing the future, risk-taking, manifesting, focusing, and connecting. And these all have both um, spiritual practices that go with them and very grounded business practices that go with each of these skills. Um, so we've talked a little bit about sensing the future and risk-taking already. Manifesting has um, is the practical part of taking a vision and putting it into action and making things happen that have positive impact. Focusing is, is something like, let's give this one as an example of a spiritual practice and business practice. So the spiritual practice is meditation. That's one of them. Uh, where you might focus on a candle or focus on your breath or some other meditative uh, practice that treat, teaches you how to be single pointed and clear. And, 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 and some people talk about it as mind training or brain training. In the business world, that's prioritizing strategy, um, being able to figure out what's the important thing, time management. Those are all elements of focusing that are day-to-day -day business skills. And then connecting, and again, we find that's another similarity with uh, intellectual shamans, is edgewalkers are connectors and they're always looking for the connection between people, like always saying, oh, Michael, you need to meet Redmila. And Redmila, if you talk to Michael, this is how he can help you. And this is how you can help him. Always looking for those interconnections, but looking for them intellectually as well. You know, how human resources is connected to rocket science or quantum physics, or, you know, looking for the, the way things are connected um, with the bottom line, understanding that everything is connected. Interconnection, we are one. And so looking for where is that oneness and how can we strengthen it? So there are practices and skills and exercises for all of these of skill development. I think I'm gonna skip this because I wanna open it up for questions in a minute, but you know, this is just one example of um, ways of sensing the future. And we can share these slides with you later.
So here's some just basic ways of cultivating the Edgewalker skills and qualities. And for me, number one is nature is a teacher. We need to protect nature. We need to love nature. We need to be in nature. That is so essential for leadership development, for human development. Um, and um, it nurtures our soul to be in nature, to be quiet, to listen, to learn. Um, contemplative practices are essential, whatever they are. And I love to recommend Chris Laszlo and Fred Sow's book, um, The Quantum Leadership. The back of that book has a list of hundred, uh, like a hundred practices in different categories. Um, and so if you're not sure what to do, that book has uh, lots of ideas. Get out of your bubble. And uh, for me, having isolated for three years during COVID, I know what it's like to be in a bubble, but thank God for Zoom, which allowed me to connect worldwide with people doing amazing work, um, such a blessing. But to meet new people, have new experiences, travel, I mean, even learn a new language because it changes our brain and expands us to think differently and to make new connections value differences and this is where diversity equity and inclusion really comes in is to be very curious about other people ask questions try to learn try to understand don't worry about making mistakes if it's a clear loving curiosity people love that kind of interest and then you develop new friendships new understanding of people who see the world differently and that helps you see the world differently Hang out with edge walkers, hang out with the intellectual shamans and the transformation catalysts. Um, Sandra was brilliant in going and interviewing 28 intellectual shamans that she admired because she can learn from those people and then categorize that knowledge and share it with others and build this community like she's done. And so it just grows, it ripples out. And then we all become more edge walkers, more transformation catalysts. Um, and then finally, I, if you're curious and really want to go deeper, I have some assessment instruments, one called the Edgewalker Profile and the other Archetypes of Change assessment that helps you know more specifically about your Edgewalker skills and qualities. Um, and then a little bit more about this model called the Archetypes of Change. Very quickly about this model, um, Edgewalkers is one way of responding to change. And when I've done all kinds of workshops and talks about edge walkers, people go, I don't relate to being an edge walker. Does that mean I'm not valuable? And, and actually I find somewhere, depending on the organization, somewhere between five and 15% of an organization are people who are really edge walkers. Most people have some edge walker-ness to them. All of us have the ability to become shamans but it's latent in a lot of people. And so there are, are four other ways I've found people responding to change. Guardians are ones who are fearful of change, but who have an intuition about it. Placeholders are those who really long for the past and wish to keep things stable and hold in place. Flame keepers are those who remember the founding values, the founding flame of an organization. And despite whatever's changing, they want to keep that flame alive. And hearth tenders are the ones who tend the fires of the organization, getting the day-to-day -day work done. So there's another whole model and an assessment around that. Some resources that are available if you want to learn more is the edgewalkers.org website. And as Sandra mentioned, my book, Edgewalkers, um, for the Global Consciousness Institute, our website is gci.earth. I've mentioned the Archetypes of Change Survey and the Edgewalker Profile. We have a free newsletter that you can sign up for on the Edgewalker website. And we do monthly Edgewalker cafes. Um, the, our community, the Edgewalker community is growing. And so we're going to be starting to do twice as many, um, two, two cafes a month, maybe even three. Um, so there's lots of opportunities to get involved. And I want to end with this quote from Willis Harmon, who was also a huge inspiration for me, particularly around the Workplace Spirituality book. And this comes from his book called Creative Work. 
business, the motor of our society, has become the opportunity to be a new creative force on the planet, a force which could contribute to the well-being of many. For that to occur, we must all substantially increase our commitment to integrity and accountability and courageously, and this is my favorite part, courageously make a quantum leap in consciousness beyond conventional solutions, beyond opposing forces, beyond fear and hope. So, there Thank we go. you. Thank you, Judy. That was amazing. Um, and I know there are a couple questions in the chat. Please put any other questions in the chat or I'm going to ask Judy a few questions because her talk raised a whole bunch of things for me. But I want to explain that Judy and I met initially at a panel at the Academy of Management. I don't remember what year it was, but it was like 2004 or something like that. And maybe 2005. And a couple of weeks later, we were, well, I was at music camp because I too am a musician, not like Judy, but, um, and there were a group of us standing around talking about that. Isn't it ironic the fact that the four of us here are all professors? And I looked over at Judy, who I had not grokked from the um, meeting a couple of weeks earlier and went, oh my God, of course. Um, you know, we were on a panel two weeks ago. So Judy, <clears throat> that raises the question for me of how do you span the boundary between your music and this intellectual work that you're doing? <laughs> well, I remember that moment so well, Sandra, and I remember your panel, and I remember the title was something like Radicals, Rogues, and like there was a third thing, but it, you know, it was it was an edgy topic about those of us that was before intellectual shamans. But it was, uh, I think, shaman was in the title though. And um, so, how do I span those worlds that you and I both walk in? And I think I'll give you the answer that Tammy Simon, the head of Sounds True, this is the, the question, the answer I asked when I asked Tammy, how does she? integrate the spiritual world and the the material and business world she said there's no two there, there's only one world there's not two worlds so there's nothing to span and so for me music and teaching and research writing it's all the same. It's tapping into source. That would be my language, tapping into source. Or um, sometimes I talk about the muse, you know, that, that I'm given um, information that I try to, in a way, channel and use my background to make sense of it to share with others. Uh, and my guiding principle is to do what brings me joy. Music brings me joy. Writing brings me joy. Um, being a part of the MSR community and the Edgewalker community, all of these communities, it, it brings me joy because of the connections and the love and the shared vision of together us making the world a better place. Yeah, that's sort of the way what I thought you would say. <laughs> so, well, and um, plus, I bring music into the classroom and into my workshops, and um, I, I really think there's an energy to music, as you know. You've done the same thing, and so to um, to play music at the beginning of a session settles people down, and they can let go of whatever that bothered them before they came in. They can be present. They can learn more. They can be their own clear channels, and we're we're in a more resonance of vibration with each other. Yeah, I, I'm I'm too shy about my music to bring it into the classroom, but um, but um, but I also know many of your songs um, make this bridge into spiritual issues too, particularly nature based stuff as you were talking about earlier. Um, I'm wondering you, you this new initiative you have this Global Consciousness Institute. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about. Um, the kind of work that it's doing and what you hope to achieve with it and where other people might participate in it. Absolutely. Yeah, this is like this is my leading edge now um, for 
20, 25 years, whatever it's been, I've been focusing on workplace spirituality. And, and like Willis Harmon in that quote that I just read, I've really seen business as the highest leverage point and business schools and business education as the highest leverage point to shift collective consciousness. And about seven or eight years ago, I began to feel like that's not enough, particularly around sustainability, um, social injustice, and the amount of wars and conflict in the world. Business does play a role, but it's not enough. And then as our government began to fall apart here in the U.S. and in several other countries, um, I, I and COVID and all these systems falling apart, it's like this is so much bigger. And that's why your work on tra catalyzing transformation was so important to me, is this is so much bigger than just business. Again, business has a huge role, but so it's it's a global consciousness domain that several of us, Chris Laszlo and, and Julia Sturberg Walker and several others have joined together to do three things, research and teaching, which would be the scholarly piece of things, leadership development and organizational development. So doing something in organizations, particularly for-profit organizations, but also large nonprofits and movement building to find who else is doing work in this domain because we need to, I love your word, Sandra, amplify. We need to amplify each other's work. We need to collaborate, cohere, and amplify what other organizations are doing, um, not reinvent the wheel, not start from scratch, um, find ways to share resources. So the couple of the initiatives of the Global Consciousness Institute is we're designing curriculum that um, can be used uh, like in a master's degree program and then other curriculum that can be used in leadership development in organizations and um, curriculum that can be shared and learning what other curriculum curricula people are developing so that we're doing research and publishing on global consciousness and um, you know, journal articles and books and things like that. So that's the scholarly part. And then the the movement building, and that's one of the things I'm so grateful for the conversation you and I had a few months ago. Another project's called Mapping the Terrain of Global Consciousness Organizations. And it's finding out who else is doing work and what they're doing and how we can support each other. And again, how we amplify each other's work. And this is happening around the world. And um, the, the areas I know the most about are what's going on in India, Singapore, and Africa. Besides the United, lots going on in the United States, but, the, but those are some other international initiatives that I know about. And it's such a delight. Again, it's one of those things that brings me joy. Like I, I've um, reached out to Shadrach Mazaza, who runs the African, the Institute for African, Institute for Conscious, oh, I can't remember, Consciousness in Africa, something like that. Um, and, you know, seeing what we can do to help him and the programs he's developing at his university. And so now we talk monthly and he's become a friend and just a joy and a teacher. I mean, he's so wise. So those are some of the kinds of things that, that we're doing. And we still feel like we're in formation and getting clarity about what's next. But as you know, this sort of shamanic path is you can't see the clear path ahead. You, it's not strategic planning and we do one, two, three, four, five. You, all you ever know is one. What is the next step? So for us, the next step is reaching out to like-minded people. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's an emergent process. Um, yeah. And um, there's, and I, it, in my experience, it takes years sometimes for these organizations, these types of catalytic organizations to come together um, and really understand what their mission is. Not that I have a huge amount of experience with that. I am going to um, ask that, a um, couple members of the audience ask their questions. Um, I'm going to start with Linda. And if anybody else has questions, you, um, if you want to put it, either raise your hand or put them in the chat. 
So Linda, can you unmute yourself and ask Julie your question? I think my question was answered with the um, information about the assessments about, um, because my question was um, the qualities of an edge walker. And if you have a few and you're not sure about a couple of the other qualities, um, you know, can you still be an edge walker? And um, thankfully, Judy explained that in her book, there are some assessments that one can go through um, to kind of determine both where you are and perhaps how to improve it. Do I understand that correctly, Judy? Almost, Linda. Thank you. Thank you so much. The um, In the book, there's a 20-item a checklist that's called, Are You an Edge Walker? And it's also on our website, so you don't need to buy the book. In fact, the book is actually going out of print. Unless all of you buy the book, then they'll... <laughs> And they'll keep it in print, but it's about to go out of print. Um, but on the website is this 20 item checklist and it, it's non-scientific. And it says, well, if you check 12 or more of these, you're probably an edge walker. Um, but that I wouldn't put a lot of stock in that. It's just for conversation. And it's a fun thing to do in workshops. The um, edge walker profile, you can find out more about that on the website. That costs $25. You get a 14-page report and guidance on actions that you can take if you want to develop one of those qualities or skills or more. Uh, and then there's coaching that goes with that if you want to go into it more deeply. That assessment instrument was co-developed with Linda Hoops, and she's my statistician partner. Uh, and so it is a valid and reliable instrument. It's designed for self-assessment and for coaching. And then the um, Archetypes of Change survey is designed for those who are dealing with change and wanting to know how to bring more of the edge walker orientation, because we all have all of these edge walker qualities and skills in us. But if you want to enhance, amplify, my new favorite word from Sandra, if you want to amplify the any of the Edgewalker qualities or, or the um, Edgewalker way of being in the world, then there are all kinds of tools and support for doing that. Thanks, Judy. And I highly recommend Judy's book. It's, it's really fantastic. Um, um, Georgia, would you like to ask your question? Are you still here? Yes. Yes, yes. I just had a practical question, actually, um, because I'm having I'm getting a lot of feedback, having trouble framing transformation, for example, in organization, in organizational theory or in managerial theory, because we're trying to frame love as a catalyst for transformation. And I know that you framed it in transformational theory and some leadership theory, but I was wondering if you have some bridges with organizational and management theory that I could um, get some ideas from. Hmm. You know, it's so funny because these days, um, at this stage of my life, I I just don't think in theories anymore. <laughs> I've moved into this more intuitive and hard space. And so first of all, Georgia, it's so beautiful to see you and to be with you. Damn. <laughs> and um, so I cannot answer that from that intellectual point of view. I can send you my chapter on transformation that maybe there's something in there that was in, I did the handbook of transform of yeah. personal and organizational transformation. And so I have like this long chapter that sort of overviews different theories and things like that. I, it's like, it's not in my head. <laughs> at, at the risk of self-promotion here, um, I would suggest that management as a discipline, organizational studies in particular, is far too narrowly focused to deal with transform transformation. There is a quite a big literature out there in the world of transformation specialists who know what they're talking about. Um, and are really working on systemic change. But boy, look for the keywords, look for the articles in our journals on transformation, and there are absolutely none. The closest our field comes, and that's in uh, all of our disciplines, is with thinking about 
quote unquote grand challenges, which tend to be ta tackled individually as if they're not part of what's now being called polycrisis, this intersecting mix of problems. And so management as sort of a field of study is way behind um, on any of these um, on any of this issues. So I'd urge you, um, look at any of my articles or um, or uh, look up the work of Karen O'Brien. Um, there's there's a ton of great people out there, but they're not in management. Um, they're doing work from an ecological, a geograph geographical, or a, um, a marine, you know, marine science. Iago Otero, Otero has written some great stuff. Paris Olson from the, uh, the um, uh, Stockholm Resilience Institute. There's a bunch of folks who are really well known in this. Yohan Fazy, uh, Bruce Goldstein, people well known in this in this arena of system ch change, who are actually doing this work um, and theorizing about it. I would also um, I think I have an article that's just been accepted that synthesizes my book, but um, there's a lot of references in my book as well. Sorry to toot my own horn here, but um, uh, let me see. Uh, Jonathan, you had a question. You still here? Yes, I'm still here. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Judy. If, uh, really, uh, it was such a rich presentation and so thought-provoking, and I love the photographs too and the images, um, which, which spoke a thousand words. But And it got me thinking about the people I've known who have in some ways, uh, I suppose, fulfilled, so at, least some, at least for me, the sort of edge walking transitional, sort of transitioning and, and, and image and impression, a sense of connectivity to other worlds and more uh, different, a different order of understanding, appreciated sensing. Um, and, and, and then you moved on to, uh, to describe what I sort of summarized as the sort of niceness of people. Uh, of edge walkers, and and I, that that's where I, I kind of slightly lost because I thought actually not all the edge walkers I've known I would say were particularly uh, sort of nice. They weren't sort of engaged or available. Uh, mm. On um, mm. you know they were often very committed. I don't know in, in other places. You know they were they were doing other things, um, but that didn't stop them being a, a sort of for me anyway a sort of portal or gateway or guide or something. <laughs> I love what you're saying, Jonathan. I have uh, two thoughts about that. And one is that um, there's an edginess to edge walkers that can put a lot of people off, especially that quality of high integrity. I mean, they have very high standards and they don't suffer fools. And so that there can be this judgment and edginess and um, and the passion. can If you're focused on your calling, you don't you don't want to go play golf. You don't want, you know, it's like, you don't want to have small talk that your Jim Stoner is a great example of this, this passion, this integrity, this urgency of what needs to happen and what we all need to be collectively focused on. It is not nice, but it's compelling. And so, so I, I really get that part. There's a, there's another thing that, um, I call going over the edge, edge walkers who've gone over the edge. And my the, the disturbing awakening for me was President Trump in the US has many edge walker qualities. He does so many things by gut and by intuition and has huge impact, but it is not, it's so ego centered and so, um, so driven by power that he's gone over the edge. If he were to be able to pull back to a healthy place, he could have been a powerful good a leader for good. And so uh, there's a sort of tautological defining of edge walkers who are committed to the greater good. Um, that's part of my definition. They are committed to the greater good. So if somebody's not committed to the greater good, in my definition, they're not an edge walker. But they they could be edgy and they could be, you know, on the edge of systems. But I I wanted to study those who wanted to make and are making a positive difference. Yeah, that's core, of course the healing orientation. It's about making the world better, not worse. Um, and so it, it's 
it's vitally important. Um, there's a couple more questions, and then I'm going to turn to the people who have their hands up. Joel, um, hi Judy, it's so hi, nice Joel. to be be with you again. I love Joel, you. Joel. Mwah, mwah, mwah. <laughs> I love you. I so love I you. I love you too. <laughs> and you are both compelling and nice. So there goes that theory. <laughs> <laughs> and this is just a small little point. In one of your last uh, PowerPoints, you, you had a, a bullet that said uh, beyond something and beyond hope. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was a quote from Willis Harmon. And the words were beyond conventional solutions, beyond opposing forces, beyond fear and hope. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of like the roomy quote of there is a field out beyond right and wrong there is a field i'll meet you there that's that's very similar kind of quote i always felt hope was kind of central to the whole thing of edge walking so i was just struck by that particular thing oh, beyond yeah. fear and hope well hope has an unknowingness to it and there is this place of knowing that is essential to a shaman, to an edge walker. Not that somebody who's in their edge walker beingness, their orientation, knows everything, but there are things an edge walker knows. They don't know how they know, but they know for certain what's theirs to do, what is their particular strength or skills or gifts. There are certain knowings that are not rational, that are beyond opposing forces beyond fear and hope they're just so gut level and we operate when we operate out of that we're in alignment with the forces of the universe if i can get cosmic and i know i can get cosmic with you <laughs> <laughs> you know so that that's what that means to me you know it's the quantum leap beyond the differences to the sense of oneness or connection to source, a connection to why why we're here in this lifetime at this point in time. That help? Yeah, and at the same time, my Eastern European grandmother always was fond of saying, we live in hope. Well, and yeah, from another perspective, I have a, a friend named Martha Finney who's written a lot of human resource books. And she never wrote this book, but she wanted to do a whole book on hope because she said hope is central to being human. Without hope, we cannot do anything. Yeah. And so from that, and I always love that. And I, I think of that so much. And you think about these times that we're in right now. And if we did not have hope, how are we going to address climate change? How are we going to address social injustice? How are we going to address surviving in the next pandemic? We have to believe, and we have to believe in the goodness of humanity. We have to hope that we're right about that. Hmm. So, so I, you know, I, I do buy that. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. I think maybe Sheldon, um, he, he or she, I don't know. Um, put this in the comment and was what I was going to suggest is that it's maybe also beyond hope to bring to bringing into being what is hoped for. So it's beyond hope. It's a, it's about doing and it links what you said earlier, Judy, about um, it's not just about sitting there staring at your navel and meditating. It's about then going into the world and making something different happen. Um, Enrico, you have the last question before I turn to Jim. Enrico, I see you're still here. Hello, Enrico. Maybe I'll re I'll read the question. Um, Enrico said, "I have a question of um, if a bridge between sustainability and spirituality can actually exist, and it does. Could it be related to a religion at cross country level? Should we keep it as an argument deserving considerations in respect to shamanic leaders?" And to what extent are those leaders keen, on average, um, to building horizontal society in place of a vertical one? <laughs> Whoa! It's, not a, it's a complex question. <laughs> it is. Um, and first of all, I would say that there is a lot of hope 
in religions waking up to the importance of sustainability. And that's been about 10 or 15 years that there has been the, um, and I don't know much about it, but this sense of, um, at least in Christianity, that we're stewards of the earth and, um, and green movements within churches. And to what extent they'll reach across horizontally versus vertically, I, I really, some will, some are. And um, there's a wonderful book called The Moral Imagination by John Paul Lederach that has a chapter, chapter nine, um, called Critical Yeast. And in terms of transformation theory, you know, we don't normally talk about critical mass. And in churches and in religions, different religions, we, we need some number of people reaching horizontally. And critical mass theory says, oh, it's got 10 or 15%, and that makes millions and millions of people, and it's hard. Critical yeast theory talks about yeast as the smallest ingredient in bread, but it's the ingredient with life. It is the difference between a mass of flour and water and something that has becomes a living, breathing, growing system. And so we need the yeast, which are the intellectual shamans, the edge walkers, finding each other and coming together. And it does not need to be huge numbers. It needs to be having focus and impact, you know, commitment to impact. And so religions need to do that and religions need to do it with government and with nonprofits and with business. It's like everybody needs to be getting together with the different hands on the elephant kind of thing. Uh, and it's, but it's not huge amounts of people. It's the right people. So I don't know if that helps. Thanks, Judy. I'm um, going to turn over. There's uh, J Jim Stoner and Ravi have questions. Uh, we have about eight minutes left, so I'd ask you to keep them short so Judy gets a chance to answer. Jim? Oh, thank you so much. Um, three things. One is to thank you and Fred Zhao's brother for two things this morning that are really, really helpful to me. Um, I appreciate it more than you can imagine. Uh, number two, I'm going on next Friday, I leave for Hyderabad, India, to spend one week with Waxan University which is committed to transforming its entire business uh, graduate and undergraduate programs to be fully aligned with the need for sustainability and which are uh, halfway through that process and will be celebrating in July their success in doing so. This session, which I wanna take with me, will be extremely helpful in helping the faculty members who are transforming their core courses and other courses uh, into something appropriate for sustainability, sustaining the world rather than destroying it as edge walkers, because that's what I think they'll be doing. And um, it, uh, it'll help them uh, and me in the sense-making process, which I see as a big hunk of edge walking, mm -hmm. Carl Weick's sense-making process. Uh, and um, I really wanna thank you for that. Um, it turns out Fred Sal's brother is an architect and he's just completed a big project in the in Bhutan in a spiritual center, which I just learned about a few hours ago. And I'll send that information to you all um, if you're interested. He's got a great write-up on what he's done, which I haven't read yet, but his picture's terrific. So um, this session is really, really helpful. Thank you. Thanks, wow. Judy. Uh, thanks, Jim. R Ravi? Oh, and I just do want to say to Jim, there's a, a university in... Um, Singapore that is a business school completely committed to sustainability. Um, and I wish I could remember the name. It's S-U-S-S. -S. I'll, I'll find it out for you, Jim. Um, and I, I did an Edgewalker and Archetypes of Change workshop there last May. It was And it's, I'm very impressed with the school. <laughs> a place you would love. Oh, thank you. And one last thing. I forgot to mention it. Linda Irwin and Ariane Sani are both members of the group that's working with the Waxan folks, and that's called Organizational uh, Global Movement Initiative. Oh, I want to know more about that. You're both on the show. Thanks, Jim. Um, Ravi? You're muted. You're on mute. Ravi, you need to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. 
Uh, by the way, Jim, I'm from Hyderabad, India, so we can connect offline on that. Uh, by the way, Judy, very inspiring uh, speech. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is more conceptual. Uh, you know, the, uh, the concept of equifinality. You know, you, you can have multiple pathways to reach the same end goal. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. and, that's what uh, I was that's calling what... the fingers pointing at the moon. Yeah, but, but, but it's essentially, again, let me give you a specific example. In Vedanta philosophy, uh, if you're trying to see God, uh, which is essentially seeing uh, God in a, uh, all beings, if that's your ultimate goal, then there are multiple pathways. And they talk about bhakti, which is devotion, or knowledge, which is jnana, and so on and so forth. You can have multiple pathways to the end goal. And that's what causes some uh, edginess uh, in just talking about the edge walkers concept in play, because you clearly mentioned that you don't have an ultimate goal. You just look at the next step. And my question to you is, edge walkers do need some normative guidance <laughs> because the ultimate goal really uh, gives some directional guidance to them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, every step they take is really goalless and they could just uh, detract from maybe creating a, a common good or, you know, like you, you gave the Trump example, you know, they, they, anything that they do, would be all right if you are just be doing edge walking. So I think there should be some normative guidance to these uh, edge walkers. And you kind of alluded to that through Trump example. But, but I think you should have some ultimate goal in which you have conviction or faith. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, anything that you do, uh, as they say, if you don't have a goal, whatever you do is fine. Yeah, that's my <laughs> question to you. Yeah. Uh, yeah it, thank you. Um, and. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, I think this is a both and. I think the the ultimate goal is reunion with source or oneness or to be love in the the um, field, the energetic field. To to um, that's the it's the ultimate goal of spirituality is the ultimate goal of edge walking and there are these unique paths. So in the Vedanta, having bhakti yoga and all the different yogas, each person can find where they're called. And that's the same thing with edge walkers. Each person can find their path where they're called. And they, they never know exactly what the next step is. But the ultimate goal is a consciousness of oneness, non-duality, that to be the to know we're not separate from source, that we are source, that we are divine. To me, that's the ultimate goal. And I probably don't make that clear enough. And so I really appreciate the wisdom that you've offered. So um, I'm going to turn this over to Michael so he can talk a little bit about the note he put in the chat a little while ago. But I want to thank everyone for coming and particularly thank Judy for this great talk. Um, I think um, it's something uh, people in the chat have been saying, it's something we all need um, to bring us together. Um, I think your ideas are so inspiring and I'm so glad that you were able to join us today. And Michael, would you like to talk a little bit about what you wrote in the chat? Yeah, well, well, thank you again, Judy, and thank you, Sandra, and thank you everyone for being here. I want everybody to know that we're planning, in the spirit of what uh, Judy was saying, movement building, a conference in New York at Fordham University together with the United Nations Prime, Ashoka U, Conscious Capitalism, and B Corps, and other movements that are aligned with that, the Evolution Institute by David Sloan Wilson. Uh, June 3rd to 7th, you'll get a note, uh, so be... Be aware if you if you're willing and uh, able to come, take uh, make make a note in the calendar, and we'll send out more information soon. Thank you. So thank you all again. Uh, we're just on time here, so um, thank everyone, and um, I, what an inspiring session. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.